certainly grateful to have Butch and Arlene Carr with us. We're going to have a lot of visitors for this week is over. This is our lectureship week, and there will be speakers coming in. There will be about 32 different speakers during the week, uh, Monday through Thursday, eight each day, uh, three each morning, three each afternoon, two at night. It's going to be an excellent lectureship, and I'm looking forward to it. I hope that you are and that uh, you will take advantage of the uh, opportunity to hear these great lessons on uh, the Sermon on the Mount, one of the wonderful parts of the scripture, Matthew, Mark, rather Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and it is, uh, has been called the Magna Carta of the Christian religion. It is a wonderful, wonderful sermon, and there will be wonderful lessons in connection with it. As we come to this point, uh, uh, we're going to sing the song we generally sing here at this point. We have come into his house. I might just say this in connection. We're not talking about a physical house. The Bible speaks of the house of God, and it refers to the family of God. God is our father. Jesus is our elder brother, and we have come into this wonderful family and as the family comes together, we come together with the family to assemble around the Lord's table. Not only that, but to worship God in spirit and in truth in every act of worship that God has commanded us to engage in. Part of that is the singing of praises to God. So let's sing. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him. Christ the Lord. <clears throat> All right, as we um, come to this point, this is my newest great-grandchild. His name is Heath. He was born on, uh, I think this is Friday, January the 16th, 7 pounds and 12 ounces. He is the the grandson of Everett McAnally, and my great-grandson, and we're grateful for, for his, uh, his birth, and uh, his mother, I think, is particularly grateful because he came two weeks, two weeks and one day early, and still weighed seven pounds and 12 ounces, and uh, with regard to him coming early, she said that was quite all right with her. <laughs> she was, she was happy about all of that, and we, we're happy uh, for them. He's the son of Tyler McAnally, who is uh, the one that's mentioned from time to time as in the military in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh, he's a captain in the military. We're afraid he'll have to go back uh, uh, soon uh, overseas. Uh, we solicit your prayer on his behalf when he is gone, certainly. All right. Power of faith. We're going to be talking about this. Jesus over and over again said to his disciples, O ye of little faith. I wonder what he would say with regard to our faith today. We're to be people of great faith. We're to have strong faith, not the kind of faith the Bible speaks of as being dead, inactive faith. Uh, we need to grow in faith and uh, understand how faith comes. Faith comes how? By hearing the word of God. It's not a blind leap in the dark, but it comes by hearing the word of God. And we need to be people that study his word and lay it up in our hearts so that we can have the kind of strong faith that the Lord would have us to possess. Let me just say one other thing in this con and before I get into the lesson very far here. Some have wondered what happened to me on Sunday night and why I was over at Moffitt instead of being here. Uh, let me just give you, uh, it, it's not in 
indicative that I'm having more problems. In fact, things are better as far as my hemoglobin is concerned. Most of you have, uh, are aware perhaps that uh, I have to have something to keep my hemoglobin up, either transfusion or on the other hand, uh, medication that causes my bone marrow to produce more hemoglobin. When I was going to Flint, and I, the, the standard generally is if it drops below, if it drops below nine, then they give me a transfusion. When we were leaving for Flint, I was concerned about the fact that it was 8.9 at that particular point, and I thought, oh, I surely don't like this idea. But they talked me into believing that the shot was going to bring it up, and if it didn't, then I could go to a, the hospital there in Flint and uh, get a transfusion. Well, I left on that kind of basis, and when I got to Flint, after I took the shot here, that should bring it up. And uh, they, um, uh, when I got to Flint, it was 9.7. And I thought, wow, this is really working. It had never worked like that before, but uh, they got the timing right, and the timing is very, very important. And that's when, why when I came back for this shot, this was for a shot that I was there Sunday. They didn't want me to come on Saturday. They didn't want me to come on Monday. They wanted me to come and get the keep the schedule exactly right for the uh, for the shot that uh, keeps it up. But when I came back, it was still 9.5, and I felt well, this is really wonderful. It had not it had never worked that well, but they have they have figured out what to do for me to make it work. If they give me two units of blood, the shot doesn't work as good. I think it. My body knows if I got two units of blood, I don't really need to work on building a lot of more hemoglobin. But if they only give me one, one unit of blood, and that's what they gave a long, last time, uh, then uh, use the shots, it keeps it up, and it's done very well. It's a long time since I've had a, a uh, transfusion, and uh, we want to keep it that way. I just thought I'd explain this. That's why I had to go on Sunday afternoon. They scheduled it late, and we, uh, we went to services over in, in Tampa instead of uh, trying to race back here for services. Okay, now we're back to this. It says in the uh, 30th verse through 34, and this is the missionary journey that Paul was on, second missionary journey. And he was coming through this area and uh, uh, stopped at Philippi here. And uh, he had been cast in prison and uh, uh, beaten and cast in prison. And uh, they were singing praises at midnight. And uh, the prison doors were shaken. Their, their bonds were loose. And uh, uh, there was uh, the jailer had... Uh, drawn his sword and was about to kill himself and Paul spoke out. Paul spoke out and said, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And this is the verses that follow that give us the account of the conversion of the Philippian jailer and his family. And so uh, the, he said, What must I do? The jailer, uh, after Paul had said, Do thyself no harm, I think that made a tremendous impression upon him. He no doubt had heard these men singing praises, praying and singing praises to God. He knew they were different from ordinary men who were only filled with cursing and vulgarity and all kinds of terrible things that uh, came out of their mouth. But these men were singing praises and the earthquake came and shook the prison doors open and rather than escape, Paul had said to the man, do thyself no harm, we're all here. This, those words would be the words that would save his life. He would have killed himself if he hadn't, Paul had not said that. So it says that he brought them out, he called for a light, sprang in and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He was not a man that had a background to know about Jehovah God. He was a heathen, and he didn't know all of this, but he knew something. 
he had some idea, concept, that he was in a lost condition, and so he's saying, what must I do to be saved? Paul says to him, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Then they spoke unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, uh, and immediately he and his family were baptized, now when he brought them into his house, he set food before them and rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his house. Many times you will hear preachers preach from this, and they come down to this passage where it says, What must I do to be saved? And just go as far as verse 31 where it says, They said unto him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house, and just stop right there and not finish the rest of the conversion of this individual. That's because we live in a day and age where it's popular to preach the idea of faith only. There are many preachers who are saying, just put your hand on the radio, hand on the television set. You don't need to do anything else. Just, just put your hand on that and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If one believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, it involves more than just a matter of mental assent. You remember that James chapter 2 says, The devils believe and tremble. If thou believest in God, thou doest well. The devils believe in... But that kind of faith is faith without works. We'll get to that a little bit later. That faith without works is dead being alone. Does God want people to have dead faith? Will dead faith save anybody? The answer is simply no. We need to have a faith that is alive and active. As we pointed out, Jesus criticized over and over again these disciples who had little faith. But their faith was not a dead faith. It nevertheless, even though it was a little faith, it was one that was alive and it was growing. And wherever along the way we are, we need to have faith that continues to grow. So he says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. This man doesn't know what to believe about Jesus Christ. He probably had never heard. The gospel had never been preached in Philippi. Paul had come over into Macedonia because he had, he had seen a vision, a man of Macedonia saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Leaving Asia Minor, and coming across the Aegean Sea there into that area to uh, Philippi, he was fir first preaching the gospel then in Europe. That was the beginning of the preaching of the gospel on the, the area of Europe. As he comes to Philippi and then to Thessalonica and on down to Berea and then to Athens and to Corinth and, and uh, had a great great success in, in these areas, though there was a lot of persecution, and he had to leave several of them very quickly because his life was in danger. It wasn't easy. But nevertheless, Paul was very successful in that which he did, establishing congregations in many of these cities as he went along the way. So in this case, he's saying to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He didn't just drop it there. The man didn't know what to believe. So it says in verse 32, They spake the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. They preached the gospel to him is what they were doing, telling him what he was to believe and what is involved in doing those things that were... Uh, to be brought about by faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The man had to hear the gospel preached in order to have saving faith. It wasn't just a leap in the dark. It wasn't just something that uh, was mysterious or something like that. He had to hear the gospel preached in order to, to know what to do to be saved. Spoken to him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and his family were baptized. Faith, when men preach the word of God and produce the kind of faith, they produce the actions of faith. 
the individual that needed to know what he must do to be saved. First of all, he was to believe, but he was to hear the gospel preached in order to know what the Lord would have him to do. And notice it says, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. It's interesting to note that every case of conversion in the book of Acts, people who obeyed the gospel did it immediately. In Acts chapter 2, that same day, 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel. They had been cut to the heart by the preaching of Paul. They said, what must we do? And a rather preaching of Peter and and Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. They didn't put off their baptism for two weeks or a month. They that glad to receive the word were baptized. The Lord added to them that day about 3,000 souls, thousands of them obeyed the gospel. And day by day they continued. If you look at the last verse, the Lord was adding to the church day by day such as should be saved. But you just go along the way as you come to the... Uh, th those who were in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts as Philip went down to Samaria and preached to them and great numbers of them obeyed the gospel they uh, did it immediately and the, Philipp or rather the Ethiopian nobleman that was riding in the chariot stopped the chariot after he had heard the gospel preached and went down in the water and was baptized there that same that same day over and over again this is the case and in this situation he took them the same hour of the night there's no point in putting off one's obedience to the gospel immediately he uh, and immediately he and his family were baptized if it's important to do it it's important to do it right away and when he had brought them out into his house he set food before them and they rejoiced, having believed in God and all his household. Now, one of the things all of us love to do is um, to get together and eat. That's not why they're rejoicing, because of the food. I suspect that, that uh, Paul and uh, Silas here were, were very hungry at this particular point, and so they fed them. But uh, the rejoicing is because this, this family has obeyed the gospel of Christ. I would make this other point too. There are those who say, well, uh, he baptized the, the whole household. That meant he baptized the babies that were in the household. No indication there were any babies there. Those who are to be baptized must be taught. They must believe and be baptized. Babies are not subject to baptism because they have no sins. They can't understand and believe and they can't respond in that kind of way. Uh, so uh, what it is saying, he took them, or rather spoke the word of the Lord to all that were in his house. Those who were in his house were people who were able to understand, hear and understand and to obey the gospel of Christ. And so he brought them out, set food before them, and they rejoiced, believing in God. It's also important for us to realize that over and over again, when people obeyed the gospel, there was great rejoicing. In Acts chapter 8, when Philip went to Samaria, there was great joy in that city. That's what it says. The Ethiopian nobleman went on his way rejoicing. There's something wonderful about the birth of a child, whether it's physical or spiritual. And that's certainly true with regard to the family of God. When people are baptized into Christ, there is rejoicing. It is a wonderful, wonderful occasion. And uh, this is uh, indicated in what you see in that passage. Now getting to Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 14 through 18, it says, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? These passages are certainly passages that, that we hear a great deal in connection with the school of preaching. Preachers have to be trained. They have to be sent. They have to be prepared. 
and uh, people have to hear the gospel in order that they, churches, the church may become stronger, well-equipped uh, to do the work that it does, and people can hear the glad tidings of the gospel. And so he says, how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel of peace and who bring glad tidings of good things. Why is it he's saying that their feet is beautiful? Uh, that's how the gospel was carried, from house to house. Uh, it was carried from one place. In many, many cases, they, they walked, they traveled to, to get there. So in many cases, it was that people would go from door to door. They would go publicly, they carrying the gospel of Christ. And so this idea of it being transported in that kind of way. The Great Commission says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. It doesn't tell us how we're to go. One can go by walking. One can go by riding a donkey. I suppose by riding a camel, if one was riding a camel. On horseback, he can go by a super jet. He can go by ship. That didn't make any difference. That is not a specific term that they were to that they were to go in a certain way but the the command to preach the gospel is specific we're not to preach anything except the gospel we're not to preach pop psychology we're not to preach just to entertain men we're to preach the gospel of Christ and so the great commission contains both specific and on the other hand, it has a generic command involved with it. Going is generic. We go anywhere we want, to, we want to go, whatever is practical. But what we preach is to be the gospel of Christ. But he says, how shall they preach except they be sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good thing. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord who hath believed our report. This goes back to Isaiah chapter 53, the uh, picture of the suffering servant of God, Jesus Christ, who uh, was taken as a lamb before his sheriff, dumb so open in not his mouth. And that's a beautiful picture of how he, our sins were laid upon him. Uh, he bore the iniquity of us all. And uh, the point was that they didn't, uh, they didn't see anything in him, any beauty in him to behold him. The, they, uh, they refused him, despised him, and rejected him. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And so it was prophesied that that would be the kind of situation. And here we find him quoting this, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's the only way that faith comes. We need to have uh, the gospel preached to us in order that we may grow in faith, be the kind of people that have the kind of faith that's strong enough to sustain us in the difficult times, and the difficult problems that come to us in life. <clears throat> the word faith is used in a number of different ways. It is used uh, certainly in, in connection with the, the scripture. The word of God is the basis of our faith. It is spoken of in a connection with the system, the entire system of Christianity. The faith once for all delivered to the saints. Jude chapter one, only one chapter in the little book of Jude in verse three. Jude says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful that I should write unto you and exhort you that you should contend for the faith. Contend for what? Contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. It uh, is not a continual revelation. We're not still having new revelations from God. It was something that was delivered once and for all time. And uh, there will not be the need of a new New Testament, a new gospel, 
uh, with that different teaching in it. Uh, we just need to preach the gospel that we have. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But I say they have not, but I say have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Notice that um, at the very beginning, the gospel went from Jerusalem to where? Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. It rapidly went. It uh, took some persecution to cause it to go. In the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, there was great persecution that came down upon the church and they were scattered abroad and they went everywhere doing what? Everywhere preaching the word. That's important to know. God's uh, providence, I believe, is involved in what happened and how that they went everywhere preaching the word. And as you come to this point, the sound had gone throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. That doesn't mean that everybody had heard, but it had spread in every direction. Actually, from the very beginning, do you remember that on Pentecost, there were about 15 different nationalities that were there that heard the gospel preached, and out of those 3,000 souls, no doubt there were people from so many parts of the world that went back and carried the gospel with them but there was a continual need to, for them, for men like Paul to go and to preach throughout Asia Minor and throughout Europe and, and various directions. Other apostles went in other way, un, into other directions to carry the gospel. But it wasn't just the apostles. In fact, at the beginning that they were scattered abroad and went everywhere, the apostles were still there at Jerusalem, but these Christians were going and they were preaching the word and carrying it uh, to the ends of the earth. Now the importance also for us to realize what kind of faith that we, that we are to have. This passage speaks with faith without works being dead. James chapter two and verse 14 through 26. What does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works can faith save him? What does the world say generally? Yeah. Oh, they say absolutely. Faith is all that's necessary. Just, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. The idea that uh, one can simply pray the sinner's prayer. Have you ever looked in the Bible to find out where the sinner's prayer is? The sinner's prayer is just not there. It surprises a lot of denominational people who thought they were saved by saying the sinner's prayer that, that the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible and no one was ever told to simply pray the sinner's prayer. If you look at all the cases of conversion, the book of Acts is filled with cases of conversion, nobody was ever told to do that. It is important to have faith, but faith it comes by hearing the word of God it is a system of faith. We are to preach it and uh, cause faith to be established in the heart of an individual. And then that involves the doing of those things that the Lord commands. So it says, what doth it profit my brethren? If someone say I have faith but does not have works, can faith save him? And then he goes ahead to, Continue that line of thinking. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one say to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, but do not give them the things that are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Well, we can, we can say that we uh, uh, w wish, they were, wish they were not hungry and wish they were not cold, but if we don't do something for them, we, they have not been profited. You can imagine, here's a person who is starving and you take him into your house and say, I want you to see all the food we got here. I want you to look in my pantry and, and uh, isn't this wonderful, but you don't give him anything. <laughs> or you take him back to the, 
walk-in closet, and I want you to see all the clothes I've got, all the shoes that my wife has, and uh, all of these things that, uh, that we have here. You don't, but you don't give them anything to make them warm. Does it profit anything? That's the point in this. That's true with regard to faith. It's true with regard to love. If I love my brother, then I'm going to, I'm going to share with him the things that I need. But faith without works is dead, the scripture says. Brother is destitute of daily food, and you say to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, do not give them the things that are needful of the body, what doth it profit? One of the things with regard to pure religion, James tells us what pure religion is in James 1, 20, 27. Pure religion is what? To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. That involves more really than just just going to see them and saying hi and bye. Because really we are to to help them, we are to assist them in their needs and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Uh, just the matter of saying hi and bye doesn't doesn't get anything, doesn't there's no profit to it. It's like saying, be you warmed and filled. Thus also, faith by itself does not have, uh, if it does not have works, is dead, is, uh, you know, is dead. Somehow I got the is dead also uh, there, a little bit out of, uh, out of the uh, translation. All right. Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Christians are to be a light to the world, a city set on a hill. We are to have influence because we have the kind of faith that is active and can be seen and we let our light shine by, by doing that. And so if here's a person who says, you have faith and uh, I have works, his answer is, show me your faith without your work. How can one show his faith except by the works that they do? A person can say all uh, he wants to, that I have, I love the Lord and I love the church and I have faith in, in the Lord but I don't attend services and I don't come to worship service and I don't do anything for the Lord. I just have great faith. No, that's not, that's not great faith. We show our faith by our works. He says, you believe there is one God, you do well. Even the devils believe and tremble. Does the Lord want us to have that kind of faith that uh, doesn't have any works? Uh, the devils have the kind that uh, believes and trembles, but it doesn't say believes and does anything. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? What a tremendous example this is. God had said to Abraham that he was to offer his son, his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice to God. Now, what kind of problem would Abraham have with this? Isaac, Isaac was his only son, the son of promise. He was the one that God had promised to him and it took him a hundred years to get that son. Now he had had another son, uh, Ishmael, driven out, you remember, but uh, that wasn't the son of promise. And so God is saying to him, this beloved son, this, this son of promise that through which all nations of the earth are going to be blessed, you're to take him and offer him as a sacrifice. And certainly this is something that uh, that would have been a great test of faith on the part of Abraham. Uh, how quickly could you have decided to go and do that? 
What's the Bible say about Abraham? It says he got up early, early the next day, and began that journey. Took his servants and he took his son and they began the journey to Mount Moriah uh, to offer his son as a sacrifice. I've said this several times. If there ever was a time that I'd want to sleep in, that would be the day I'd want to sleep in. Uh, but uh, Abraham was ready to do immediately what God told him to do, and he began that long journey. Uh, they came, and it must have been a heart-rending thing when, as they left the servants behind and began to go up to do the sacrifice that uh, Isaac said to him, he said, uh, here's the wood. All the things were in the fire. They had the wood in the fire. Dad, where's the sacrifice? Wouldn't that bother you a little bit? Uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't say, well, son, you're the sacrifice. But that's what was in his heart. What did he say? He said, God will provide. That's always true. God provides for us. And after he had bound the son, put him on the altar, and raised the knife in order to take his life, God stayed his hand and said, Do thy child no harm. Did God provide the sacrifice? How did he provide the sacrifice? Okay, there was a ram in the thicket. Ram in the thicket caught his horns. He became the sacrifice. God had provided the sacrifice. But what tremendous faith this was. What did he think was going to happen? How did he think that God was going to have him sacrifice this son, the child of promise, and still fulfill the prophecies that had been given. He thought that God was going to do what? Raise him up from the dead. That requires a lot of faith, doesn't it? For a person to, to think ahead and believe that God would raise up his son from the dead. A lot of people had trouble believing that, that God was going to raise Jesus up. But here's Abraham's great faith. Yes. Romans 4, 20 and 21. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. That's, that's what we have to, all of us have to come to that conclusion if we have the right attitude, Amen. that what God has promised, he is able to perform. God is able. Our God is able. The three Hebrew children were about to be cast in the furnace. They said, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not bow down to that image. We, uh, our God is able to deliver us in the fire furnace, but if not, if he doesn't choose to do that, they still weren't going to bow down. Our God is able. We need to remember that. So moving on in this, he says, uh, Thou believest in God that doeth, devils believe and tremble. Was not Abraham our father justified? And in verse 22 it says, uh, Do you see that faith, was, that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And that's what the truth of the matter is. We need to have strong faith. We need to have the works that make it indeed perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The Lord wants us to have strong faith, not dead faith. He wants us to have faith that, that works in love 
it is important for us to, to know that we can't earn our salvation by works. We couldn't in a hundred lifetimes do enough good works to earn our salvation. But nevertheless, the kind of faith that we're to have is faith that works, works in love. Not prideful faith, not prideful works, but nevertheless, uh, there's tremendous power in faith. What you believe makes all of the difference in the world. The person who has great faith in God, great faith in the scripture, great faith in the promises, that's the kind of person that has what sustains his hope, sustains him throughout the the years, the difficult times, and enables him to be faithful unto God to the end of the way. Well, we're going to stop at this point. We will continue as we come together next time with the next lesson.